Welcome to the Tales of a Red Clay Rambler podcast, featuring interviews with culture makers from around the world. This is Ben Carter. I'm going to be your host. If you'd like more information on the show, please visit our website, talesofaredclayrambler.com. Welcome back to episode 419 of the podcast. Thank you all for tuning in. On this week's edition of More Than a Maker, we're talking to John Doran. In this interview, we take a different approach to other interviews in the series in that we're thinking about statewide mental health, specifically in the state of Montana. John is the Divisional Vice President of External Affairs at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana, and in this role, he has been a part of the Big Blue Sky Initiative a multi-part plan to address mental health in the state, including suicide prevention, treatment for addiction, and other resources for mental health. If you'd like to find out more information about the initiative, you can go to their website. That's BigBlueSkyInitiativeMT.com. Without further ado, we'll get to the interview. Well, let's start off by having you introduce yourself and then also tell us what your role is at Blue Cross Blue Shield. My name is John Doran. I'm the Divisional Vice President of External Affairs at Blue Cross and Blue Shield. It sounds like a mouthful for the title, and um, certainly it is. It's a a fairly big role in our organization, and I'm really privileged to have the opportunity to to serve the residents of uh, Montana. Um, I oversee all of our government and public relations. So in the legislative years, uh, when we have a legislative session here in Helena, I uh, am at the Capitol about 120 straight days working on healthcare policy and doing all of our lobbying. Uh, And then I also uh, organize all of our community efforts. So our volunteerism, our sponsorships and grants, and then uh, also our um, community efforts like our caravan program, which is a mobile immunization unit that uh, during COVID was very, um, very valuable for communities across the state trying to build access to preventive healthcare services. And you're based in Helena? Yes. Yeah. I live and work in Helena. So We should talk about that you guys are a sponsor of our program, so I want to disclose that right up front. (laughs) Why did you guys want to sponsor a podcast about mental health? Mental health is one of our biggest priorities in Montana, and we've tried a number of different ways to break down the stigma associated with mental wellness to make some investments in the infrastructure or uh, building access for for crisis services in particular, uh, and really to take action in communities across the state. And, you know, living in Helena, we know what a valuable resource the RG Bray is. And a lot of times when people think about mental wellness services, they think about behavioral health, or they think about going to a psychiatrist, but it's so much more than that. And there are many different ways, whether it's Utilizing, uh, utilizing our great trail system in Helena, um, making sure that you're taking care of your uh, nutrition uh, and your mental health or, or doing things like the arts uh, and, and all of these different outlets for creating a very positive and sound mind and body are incredibly important when it comes to making sure we have mental wellness for everybody. And so it was a no-brainer for us to participate and, and partner with the Archie Bray on this We've partnered with RG Bray many times in the past, and it's just a wonderful uh, asset in our community here. So it was a no-brainer for us. Well, we, we definitely appreciate the support. Can you give a little bit of information about the demographics of Montana? It's a, it's a really rural state that a lot of people that have never been there, they don't quite understand the relationship between physical space and the amount of people. So can you talk about that? Yeah, and that's one of the big challenges in Montana is just our large geographic nature. Um, you know, a lot of times folks um, will joke that there are more cows than people in Montana. And while that may or may not be true, I think the, the basis of that uh, is, is very true. And that is that we are a geographically dispersed state. And with that frontier nature, there's also some very significant gaps in access to health care, um, in particular for behavioral health. And when Montana is such a large state, a lot of times the services in particular for behavioral health are centered in the, you know, the more urban settings within the cities in Montana. And so a lot of times it can mean a two hour drive in a car to, uh, to reach your provider. And sometimes that can be a big obstacle to making sure that you are 
regularly having these interactions with your provider so that we can, um, in, in a more proactive way, prevent crises before they happen. Um, and I think that's a challenge that other frontier and rural states like Montana have in terms of the number of primary care providers, um, the access really being centered in these urban areas, and the obstacles in, in particular in, in the wintertime of making those travel arrangements and actually getting to the appointments. Um, and so that's why it's, it's really important that we focus on a, a broad-based approach to creating mental wellness across the state. And in our opinion at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana, this is one of the highest priorities and really the biggest challenges that we have in this state is the mental wellness uh, that, that um, you know, the mental health problems that we have in Montana. And Montana likes to be uh, first in a lot of things. Um, you can look at the cats and the grizz and how far they've gone in, in football and their different athletics. Um, but we don't like to be first in one particular category, and that is leading the nation in the suicide rate. And that's a really unfortunate and heartbreaking statistic that we have to grapple with every single day. And mental wellness, unfortunately, all too often ends in tragedy uh, and heartbreak for, for families and communities. And I think we have a responsibility as the state's leading health insurance company to do something about it. And that's really our focus um, when it comes to mental wellness is what can we do in a proactive manner to help people overcome the adversity that they're facing, to give them the tools and the access to healthcare that they need to be able to withstand these pressures. I'm glad that you you brought up the suicide rate. It, it's not an easy thing to talk about, and and I, I appreciate the work that you guys have done to focus on that. In 2000, I think it was 2016, 17, there were eight suicides, death by suicide of teens in the East Helena area. Can you talk a little bit about when you see something specific like that, when there is a a specific outbreak of mental illness or the effects of, of um, mental illness or depression in an area. How do you guys think about that from the insurance standpoint? Like, how do you get help to people when you know help is needed? Well, first and foremost, we want to be able to reach out to communities that are in crisis like East Helena was a few years ago. And we've seen clusters like that happen across the state. Um, a few years before East Helena, Butte had a cluster of teen suicides. We've seen completions now uh, in, in the other six to eight range up in the flathead this year alone. Uh, and these are really uh, concerning. And I, I think you have to look to what, what is the root of those problems. And so when we went through that in East Helena, and you know, East Helena is a very tight-knit, hardworking, blue-collar town. And um, most of the families out there know each other and interact with each other on a regular basis. And so it didn't just impact those families who lost their children. It impacted the entire community. And so we really rallied uh, to do everything possible from um, supporting those families to supporting the communities to taking a more proactive approach and looking to the future and working with the school district to figure out ways that we can provide the tools that children need to be more resilient in these times of stress. And, you know, it, it's a very difficult time for teens these days. Uh, it's, you know, there are so many more pressures than, than when I was growing up. And when you look at all of the interaction that they have on their social media devices and their telephones, we didn't have those pressures. You know, we didn't have uh, the same concerns that go with um, the attachment that we see with these devices. And so um, we did work very, very closely with the East Helena School District, and we can get into a couple of the uh, initiatives that we helped them you know, in, uh, improve in the schools. But I think first and foremost, you just have to show compassion. And uh, ultimately, you know, if you can show compassion, then uh, someone can have hope that there's going to be uh, a more positive future ahead. What makes Montana different? Like, why why is the suicide rate, or, or why do people think? Because I know this is not an exact science of pinpointing mental health and crisis, but what does the research show about Montana in the suicide rate? Yeah, there's a lot of factors. You're exactly right, Ben. Um, and it's it's very difficult to pinpoint one exact factor as to why someone might complete suicide. It's typically a whole host of things. But, you know, number one, I think it is our rural nature. And there's a lot of isolation in Montana, especially in these small farming and, and ranching towns where you know, your neighbor's five to 10 miles away. Um, and, and so I think our isolation contributes to that. Um, you also have to look at our, uh, our societal uh, and socioeconomic status. You know, the average household income in Montana for a family of four is just over $45,000. Uh, and a lot of times financial pressures can really lead to um, some deeper problems within people. And um, so I, I think our socioeconomic status also contributes to that. 
Um, and in Montana, you know, no matter what you think of, of guns, um, there's a high access to handguns and to firearms in Montana. And, you know, not only do we typically lead the nation in suicide rate, but we also lead in completion rate. And I think that's one big reason is that, you know, guns are very final um, and um, just providing that access as well as all of the other difficulties that people are going through at any particular time. I think those are all leading up to factors that we're seeing in Montana. We're going to come back to the the role that you guys play in educating children about resiliency, but I want to talk a little bit about Blue Cross Blue Shield's role as lobbying um, politicians around these issues. I, I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that, that you guys have a unique position and that you are a corporation, but in a small state where there are not that many healthcare providers, and there's also not that many politicians, re- relatively speaking, you guys end up being an intermediary between what's happening on the ground health-wise and policy that's being made. So can you talk about that role as a lobbying entity to change laws or just just to be able to say to politicians, this is a serious issue. We're seeing this on our end a lot more than you're hearing about it on your end. We have a very big responsibility as Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana. I mean, we have more than 300,000 lives that we cover in Montana, which is just under a third of the population. So I think it's our, number one, it's our responsibility to play a, a pivotal role in shaping healthcare policy. And I take it very, very seriously. You know, uh, I have a, a daughter who just got done with her freshman year in college and a son who's a, f- a freshman in high school. And sometimes they're like, hey, what do you even do dad at work? I mean, like, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to break it down very, very simply. I educate and I influence. And, you know, we have a citizen legislature. We have 150 legislators from all four corners of the state and everywhere in between that are typically school teachers or ranchers or business owners, or they're retired um, and they're not healthcare experts. And so I view, I view my role and, and my team's role here at Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana as pivotal in making sure that we are educating our legislators to let them know the impacts of healthcare policy. So not only are we trying to develop and shape healthcare policy, we're also trying to educate and influence our legislature to make sure that we're passing legislation that doesn't have a a negative consequence uh, in terms of either cost or access. Um, And I think our biggest goal at the Capitol is to do everything possible to find healthcare policies that improve the outcomes and the health of our population, but also that drive down the cost of healthcare. And we take that very, very seriously. Um, and, And just to give you a couple of examples, Ben, uh, a couple of sessions ago in 2017, we worked very, very closely with some legislators to address opioid abuse. And I don't think you can legislate addiction. That's certainly something that someone's going to have to work through from a medical and clinical standpoint and a behavioral standpoint. But we were able to, in 2017 and 19, put some parameters on the prescribing patterns of physicians so that we can have these sideboards for one example, you know, rather than having a bottle of, you know, 150, um, you know, very, very powerful prescription pills, we limited those prescriptions to seven days. And if the, if a patient needed to go back to their provider and say, Hey, I'm still experiencing pain from this surgery or this chronic pain, then the physician could evaluate the patient and go again for seven days. And that essentially I think helped um, to help improve the the scenarios where you know, you've got a bottle of pills that's been in a, a you know a um, cabinet in the in the bathroom, and all of a sudden somebody walks in, sees them, swipes them, and takes too many of them and, and overdoses. And we've seen that happen a lot as well. So I think that's one example of how we were able to work with our legislature to improve um, the overall health of Montanans. Yeah, I appreciate the work that that you guys have done on that front. I I wanted to go a little deeper on the opioid crisis. Drugs like fentanyl have become something that people talk about in the news more now because overdose rates have gone up. Um, And I was had interviewed someone that was in addiction medicine a couple years ago, and at the time I think it was seven. This was in twenty twenty seven hundred fifty thousand opioid deaths in America, and I just looked at that statistic again after the pandemic and it's up to 800 and there was a, there was more than a hundred thousand deaths in the last two years. So what we're seeing is, is drugs that have more potency, economic stress from the pandemic, people's lives just generally are hard because of isolation. So when you guys see this, this factor, I know you said that you can't, you can't legislate addiction, but what you can do is make a treatment for addiction cheaper what steps are you taking to make it cheaper on the the consumer end or on the the patient end? 
Yeah, and that's a great question. And I think there's a, a couple of layers of, of response. When it comes to the cost of prescription drugs in particular, we work very, very closely with our pharmacy benefit manager. And that's essentially an entity that works with the health insurance company and is really the only inter intermediary or watchdog between the consumer and the manufacturer of those drugs. And the manufacturer alone sets the cost of any prescription drug. And so it's our responsibility to work with a pharmacy benefit manager to drive down that cost to a more affordable fashion. We can also work on generics, uh, making sure that we have a, a very wide formulary that offers generics, which have the same efficacy, but at a much, much uh, reduced cost than the, the brand drugs. So we're working very, very closely with our partners um, to make sure that we're addressing the cost of prescription drugs, because that is the single biggest driver right now of health healthcare costs in general, and consequently health insurance costs are prescription drugs. And a lot of those prescription drugs that are driving up the rate are the brand name injectables that you know cost $150,000 a year, um, and there's no generic uh, alternative. Um, we're seeing approximately 1% of all of our patients and, and members um, who have um, a high cost drug uh, as part of their, their um, regimen. And only 1% of our members actually utilize those drugs, but it's driving 50% of the cost of all of our membership for prescription drug costs. And so we've got to be able to address that as a state. And we took some very substantial steps the last couple of sessions to address those. But I think our nation has to uh, step in and, and act as well. And I think Congress needs to take this very, very seriously because it is a national and an international issue. And the only way that the manufacturers are going to be held accountable for those costs is if Congress takes action. And so we work very closely with our delegation, uh, with Tester and Danes and, and Rosendale to make sure that they're doing everything possible to hold the manufacturer accountable because quite honestly, big pharma can and will charge anything they want. And we've seen it over and over and over. Um, and it's at the expense of the, uh, the member and it's at the expense of the patient, but also at the expense of their pocketbook. So that's one angle from the cost. I think when you get back to how can we address the opioid epidemic? We've got to hit it on, on a number of levels. And I think, you know, Attorney General Austin Knutson has made this very clear, as well as uh, Governor Gianforte, that the infiltration we're seeing in communities of fentanyl is really coming from across our borders. Um, and, you know, we had, I think, a month and a half ago, just here in Helena, we had nine fentanyl overdoses in a week. Um, and it, it means everywhere. And so I think we need to educate. And, and when we look at education, I think all of us as parents need to make sure that we're talking to our kids because the last thing we want to see is, you know, a kid, uh, whether it's our child or somebody else, you know, grab a handful of pills that they don't know what's in it. And all of a sudden it's laced with, with fentanyl, which, you know, just a minute amount of that very potent drug is fatal. Um, so I think we need to educate our children on the, the very, very real dangers of, uh, of fentanyl, um, but also we need to make sure that we're doing everything possible to work in public and private partnerships, to work with law enforcement, uh, to do everything possible to keep those drugs out of our borders. And a lot of when we're talking about suicide and overdose, those are crisis, you know, so that's kind of the, the end stage of something. Prevention is something that is important on all levels for people from elementary school to high school to college. Even prevention, preventive medicine for folks like us is important. But can you talk about, back up and talk about what you guys are doing in the elementary schools in, in terms of increasing mental health? You bet. In 2016 or 17, 2016 actually, in 2016, we launched the Big Blue Sky Initiative, and this is Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana's signature initiative to really address opioid abuse and also mental health in Montana. And if you break it down into three areas, it's really focused on awareness in communities to try and break the stigma of mental illness. It's focused on financial investments in the healthcare system, and it's focused on action on the ground in communities across the state. So I'll just start with awareness. Um, you know, I mentioned the opioid abuse. We used the Big Blue Sky Initiative with a, uh, a public PR campaign to really educate the community, but also the legislators in the state about the need for change in the opioid prescribing patterns. And again, we were able to pass several bills in the 2017 legislative session that addressed that and put some sideboards on the prescribing patterns, which hopefully leads to less abuse of opioids in, in the future. Um, we also did a really powerful 
uh, suicide prevention and anti-bullying campaign through the Big Blue Sky Initiative. We worked with our partners, Michael Walters Advertising, who's been very, uh, very instrumental in helping us. Um, and we essentially interviewed 10 teenagers in Montana who had at some point in their early years experienced severe bullying. And we just sat down, put them behind a camera and just talked to these teenagers about the effects of bullying, about how difficult it was to go to school every day and experience bullying, but also about what in their life allowed them to work through that, to get beyond the bullying and to come out the other side a stronger person. And so the, the, the campaign was really not only focused on highlighting the impacts of bullying, but also providing hope for any teenager who might be experiencing bullying today. And after all of these interviews, we had approximately 415 different videos that we broadcast everywhere that children today digest their information. It was on TikTok, it was on YouTube, it was on Instagram and several other social media sites. And these clips were incredibly powerful. I mean, I, I, I can't tell you how brave these 10 children were to share their stories and to offer hope to others who were going through similar things. And um, you know, overall, we had approximately uh, four and a half million views over a six month span. And so I'm really encouraged that teens saw these pieces and were able to provide themselves some hope that they can get through this as well. The other thing that we've done in, in schools uh, to provide awareness is we, work, we worked with uh, a, a local musician. Uh, his name is Jason Deshaw. He's from the High Line. He's a Montana boy, um, very talented singer and songwriter. And in, um, uh, in his late 20s, Jason uh, experienced uh, a mental break and um, went through alcoholism as he tried to, to treat his own addiction and try and treat his own problems. And Jason is an incredibly powerful musician, but he's also an incredibly powerful storyteller. And he's really taken his own music and shaped it into what he calls serenity in the storm. And so we, we actually worked with Jason, provided about 50 different shows across the state in high schools, in middle schools, in community settings, where Jason could share his story. And he's become a national powerhouse. He won the National NAMI Award uh, for, uh, for advocacy. And he tells this unbelievable story about how he's experienced mental illness, but also how he's tried to get through it. And he provides this very powerful message of hope and resiliency. And I think it's been very, very well received. In fact, the Center for Mental Health Research and Recovery down at Montana State University in Bozeman did a study about Jason's advocacy. And it's, it's demonstrating very, very substantial and real and positive impacts in Montana for those teens who have seen him perform, who have listened to his message and taken it to heart. And that's one of those things, you know, you can always put up a billboard that says, hey, you know, text 811 if you're, you know, or whatever the national number is, text, you know, text the national number if you're in crisis. And those are very valuable and very helpful. But it's another thing to hear it from somebody who's a real Montanan and he's demonstrating his troubles, but also really showing the path forward for hope and resiliency. Um, and, and so those are some things that we've done to build awareness and really try and break down that stigma. You know, Montana is a rough and tumble state. If something hurts, we say, hey, rub some dirt on it, pull up your bootstraps and get back in there. But you can't do that with mental illness. It just doesn't work that way. And so to provide folks hope and really break down that stigma that, hey, if you get sick for a physical ailment, if you get cancer, you go to a hospital, you get treatment and people bring you a, a bouquet of flowers and some balloons and say, hey, you're going to get through this. If you have a mental illness, nobody wants to talk about it. It's just, the, it's the same thing. It's just a mental illness that's just like a physical illness. And so the more we can do to break down that stigma, I think the, the better we're going to be in the future and the better chance we'll have for people to get through whatever they're going through at the time. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. More Than a Maker is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana, proud sponsors of Wellness for Makers. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana is focused on building healthier communities through strategic investments to improve population health, increase access to care, and to make healthcare more affordable for all. For more information, please visit bcbsmt.com.
As you're talking about this, and as I was doing research for this interview, there was things that I was not expecting, like TikTok. I was not thinking that you guys would be doing suicide prevention on TikTok. But it, it makes sense because that that's where people are. That's where teens are. Uh, or in the case of uh, Jason DeShaw, you know, you're reaching a member of the public, whether that's in a school or a, at a public concert, that's not they're probably not thinking they're going to get mental health awareness when they show up. That's the thing that's interesting to me is how do you educate people when they're kind of when they're least expecting it? Because I think part of that Montana toughness is, is this idea that I don't need help. I don't need help. But if you can get through people's barrier when they're not paying attention and they're not putting up those walls, then all of a sudden, you know, you can get that information across. Yeah, the very first Serenity in the Storm performance that we worked with Jason on was actually in Butte following that clusters of suicides. And I'm going to get emotional for a second because it's incredibly powerful. But after that performance, one of the fathers of one of the teens who completed suicide came up to me and gave me an incredibly embracing hug and just said, I wish you would have done this two months ago. And that to me is all the reason why we need to do everything possible to break the stigma, to invest in the access, and to take action on the ground. Because if we can do all of this and save just one life, it's all worth it. It's all worth it. So let's talk a little bit more about what you guys have done in the elementary schools. Um, I know that there's, there's a couple games that you guys have been a part of funding. Can you talk about those two things? It was the uh, Praxis Good Behavior game is one, and then the other one was a a free service where middle schoolers could learn more about um, mental health. Yeah, this is really part of the action pillar of the Big Blue Sky Initiative. I mean, we wanted to do everything possible to build awareness, to break the stigma, to have these you know very powerful campaigns. But at the end of the day, we wanted on the ground action, and in particular in schools across the state. So when East Helena went through its troubling time, we sat down with Ron Whitmoyer. We sat down with Mike Claren. You know, Ron was the at the time the superintendent. Mike is still a counselor in the East Helena School District. We sat down with community members. We sat down with um, you know the mayor and really tried to figure out what can we do as Blue Cross. I mean, it's a stone's throw away, right, from where our our headquarters in Helena sits to East Helena. What can we do to help you in your time of need? And to their credit, the East Helena School District had already started working on some solutions and they came back to us with this Paxis Good Behavior game. And essentially the Paxis Good Behavior game is a a game-like structure in kindergarten through third grade, which is very, very, very innovative. It goes from kindergarten to third grade and essentially builds these resiliency tools in students' behavior so that later in life, in middle school and in high school, when these pressures really start to mount, they have the resiliency tools they need to get through those things. And so working with American Chemic Corporation, which is a very strong presence in East Helena, together Blue Cross and American Chemic fully funded the Paxis Good Behavior Game in East Helena schools in the kindergarten through third grade with the hopes that we could change a generation of students so that they have the resiliency, they have the coping mechanisms to deal with those pressures when they start to mount later in life. It's our hope that in 10 years, we'll see a dramatic improvement in the resiliency and in the suicide rate in East Helena schools. Um, One of our um, staff members here and and my colleague, Brian Haynes, his wife, Tricia, is an educator in East Helena. um, And I can't tell you how many of the teachers and faculty members have come forward and say, this is working. Thank you for helping us implement this in schools. And I think that's a really innovative way of looking at it. You know, rather than trying to address mental illness or depression or anxiety or these other coping skills in middle school or high school, we're taking that up front, you know, advancing that continuum in kindergarten and third grade in East Helena schools so that those kids can have those tools later on in life. And it's been very, very successful and very positive so far. The other big thing that we're doing is working with a partner called EverFi to implement the mental wellness basics program in schools across the state. And this is an entirely free program that Blue Cross is providing to schools for free that does very, very similar things. It's it's really based on five different priorities or five pillars. Number one, the mental wellness basics program, which is an online tool. It's an online uh, tutorial program that helps increase knowledge and awareness of mental illness and of the coping structures. 
It helps reduce stigma by prioritizing mental health as an important part of overall health. It promotes self-efficacy by modeling advocacy and and self uh, and others through the presentation of scenarios and the teaching of a variety of intervention mechanisms. And it encourages action so that when teens see something in themselves or they see something in another friend or another student, they know what action to take. And I'll just give you a few statistics that um, we've seen already in in this program, which, you know, we started this program uh, in 2019, right at the height of the pandemic. And as soon as we started implementing uh, this program, schools were shut down, schools went virtual, um, but we were still able to work with the schools to to include this mental wellness basics program in the online tutorials. And so what we've seen are just a couple of things that are very, very encouraging so far. Um, we do a, a survey of all students who participate in the Mental Wellness Basics program up front before they even take one seminar. And, in, and then we do it again at the end when they've completed the seminar. Students who, um, who started, um, one of the questions in the, in the survey is, I feel confident that, that I know how to help someone else in need. And at the start, 69% of students were confident that they knew how to help someone in need. At the end, 82% of students said they felt confident in how to help someone else get the help they need. Um, number two said that I can recognize when I need to use coping strategies to protect my, protect my own mental health. Only 61% of the students surveyed said they knew what to do for themselves before they took this course. After the course, 85% said they knew exactly what to do to take care of themselves in time of need. Uh, The next question was, if I feel that I need help with my mental health needs, I would seek help without hesitation. This is a really big one, right? Like you talked about, Ben, it's, you know, all too often we say, hey, tough it out. You know, I can get through this. I don't need help. Well, this question, only 49% of students said that they would seek help without hesitation when they were suffering. After the course, 72% said they knew and would, would seek help without hesitation. And then one of the most important things I think is that the last question says, I feel confident that I know how to find help for my own mental health needs. 62% of kids at the start of the survey said they did and 79% after the survey said they did. So what this is showing me is that this mental wellness basics program, which is now in almost 200 schools across the state is saving lives. It is playing offense to prevent the crisis down the line by building the tools necessary for kids to withstand these pressures when they when they come. One of the things uh, about the high school, the life of the average American high schooler is, is that you have a lot of pressure to get good grades, maybe. <laughs> maybe you don't, but <laughs> theoretically you have a lot of pressure to make good grades. You have a pressure to find a good place to go to college or to get a job when you graduate. You have now pressures from social media. You you basically have a, a, a crockpot. You know, there's a lot of pressure and students end up letting off steam through hopefully healthier things like playing sports or something like that. But often it turns to drug use, uh, violent behavior, depending on where you're at. I mean, I was reading statistics about violence in high schools and it was actually shocking how many violent incidents happen in high schools. Now, part of this American experience that we have is that people often blame when something goes wrong, everyone says it's mental illness. So mass shootings, for instance, if there's a mass shooting in a school, all the politicians say it's actually a mental health problem. Well, how do we solve this? Because I I want politicians to be thinking about mental health every day, not just after a mass shooting. So as an insurer and in a company that's providing a lot of these mental health education, what what do you see? Like how do you see a societal shift in how we treat both gun violence, but also just the lives of high schoolers and young people that are struggling? Yeah, that's a, a really great question. And I think my aunt, you know, I, I think health insurance companies need to think about it twofold. Number one, we need to think about it in terms of how do we invest in the infrastructure of the healthcare system. And that's the other component of the Big Blue Sky Initiative is investing financially in that system. We contributed a quarter of a million dollars to help found Montana's first ever psychiatry residency program. 
Montana was one of three states in the nation that did not have a psychiatry residency program. And, and as such, we have about half of the average norm of psychiatrists per 100,000 people in the nation. Now, most medical residencies keep about 66% to 75% of those residency students in the state where they participate. Well, the very first class of psychiatry residency programs in, uh, in the program through the Billings Clinic and the University of, of Washington, we have three students that are in their second year. If we can keep two of those students here in Montana, that's two more psychiatrists that we have to deal with our population. And as that goes on, hopefully we can keep you know, more and more psychiatry um, residency students here in the state to practice here and help our, our population through these needs. Because I think that's a huge part of it is making sure that people in crisis, whether it is a student or an adult, have the opportunity to address those things before they become a full-blown crisis so that we can manage those illnesses. We can manage those, whether it's anxiety or depression or an eating disorder, we can manage those things appropriately before they turn into a crisis. Um, we also uh, invested financially in uh, a program called Project Echo. And this was actually brought to Montana by Dr. Eric Arzubi. Um, he is one of the foremost authorities in, in particular in, in childhood uh, behavioral health. And he's done a wonderful job across the state in many different capacities of helping to expand our services here. But the Project Echo model actually comes out of New Mexico and it's more of a virtual clinic model, if you can think about that, where you've got a team of experts based anywhere in the US who can take cases and look at those cases from a 360 degree review to find out how should we approach this particular case. And it really provides some additional expertise that we may not have here in Montana from individuals and experts all across the country who can weigh in on a particular case. And maybe they've seen this case in other states, maybe they've seen similarities or have particular uh, treatment patterns. And so we can broaden the wealth of knowledge in Montana through the, the Project ECHO. But I think the second thing that we have to do, Ben, and this is something that Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana is inherently invested and committed to doing, we have to look internally at our own policies. We have to look internally at our own benefit design to make sure that we're doing everything possible to get our patients and get our members and get Montanans the access they need at the most affordable cost, whether that's no cost sharing, whether that's with a deductible, um, to make sure that we are not an obstacle to people getting the care that they need. And so we're looking internally right now, we actually have done a very thorough review of all of our own benefit structures uh, and are finding ways that we can improve our own policies so that our members can get the care they need. And I think it's one thing to sit back and pontificate and say, hey, we need to do this as a society, Congress needs to act here, the Montana legislature needs to act there. But if we're not looking inwardly, then we also are not doing our job. And so we are committed to making sure that we're doing everything possible to provide the best benefit structure, the best policies out there that cover folks, how they need it, when they need it. But again, in advance of that continuum before uh, you know an ongoing problem becomes a crisis. You mentioned, I think, that it was about 300,000 folks that are on Blue Cross Blue Shield in, in Montana. Uh, what percentage of that has mental health as a part of their plan? All of them do. In fact, um, that's one of the things that we helped pass in Montana was the mental health parity statutes. And the, uh, at the national level, Congress has also passed mental health parity, but Montana was actually ahead of the curve. And we helped our legislators understand why it was critical from the payment structure of a health insurance policy to make sure that mental health policies were at least on par, if not better than the physical health policies. And I think that's, in, that's incredibly important. Um, you know, there are some plans in Montana that are governed by what we call ERISA, which is a federal health policy. Those are typically the larger employers who self-fund their own plans. They're actually governed under different statutes at the federal level than the Montana statutes. Sometimes those policies can be determined by the employer themselves. And so they may say, hey, we're going to do this or we're going to do that. We might offer a gym membership versus a health nutritionist. Um, but all of those policies have to live up to that mental health parity statute. And that's something that is incredibly powerful in making sure that folks are getting the care that they need paid for when they need it. Well, I wanted to wrap up the interview 
asking you to, to take off your, your Blue Cross Blue Shield hat and, and just talk about as a human being that's going through a pandemic, like what do you do to take care of yourself? Well, I'm, I'm very fortunate that I get to live in Helena because we have, in my opinion, the best trail system in the state of Montana. Um, not only do we have, you know, um, approximately 150 miles of single track, which I like to use almost every day, um, it's the, the proximity of our trails to town that just makes it so easy to, to get out and take a walk, to go for a mountain bike ride, to take a trail run. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that you find whatever outlet, whether it's physical activity, whether it's arts at the Bray, um, whether it's arts at the Holter, um, you know, we have uh, Grand Street Theater, which is another valuable and, and, and wonderful resource in town in Helena. Find your outlet because you have to find that balance. And you're right, Ben. I mean, this has been a very difficult time for everybody over the last couple of years. Uh, and I think it's really intensified some of the isolation and other problems that we have here in Montana. So, um, you know, I like to, to do everything possible to, um, to maintain my mental wellness as well. And often that just includes getting outside, going for a mountain bike ride, coaching baseball, um, fly fishing on the little Blackfoot. You know, we're so fortunate here that um, really whatever your passion is, you, you can find it. But I would just encourage folks to make time. Because it, it's so easy to say, hey, I'll, I'll do that tomorrow or oh, I don't have time. But when, when that becomes a pattern over days and weeks and months, then all of the problems that we all face intensify. So um, my, my recommendation, just take time for yourself, make time for your mental wellness, um, get outside and, and enjoy all that Montana has to offer. Well, thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time. You bet, Ben. Thanks again. And uh, thanks again for all that the Bray does. We're very fortunate to have you in town. I'd like to thank John for coming on the show. I appreciate him taking the time. And I'm also grateful for Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Montana supporting the series more than a maker. If you'd like to find out more information about the Big Blue Sky Initiative and the things that they're doing to address mental health in the state of Montana, you can check out their website at bigbluesskyinitiativemt.com. I'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you all for tuning in. If you'd like more information on the artists on the show, or if you'd like more information about the workshops and events that I'll be having in the next couple months, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook under Carter Pottery. Another great way to support the show is to leave me a comment on iTunes. To do that, search Tales of a Red Clay Rambler under iTunes Podcasts, and you'll find a page that's linked to our show. Thank you guys for the support. We respectfully acknowledge and honor all indigenous communities whose lands we reside on in the United States and recognize that we are uninvited guests on the occupied, unceded, and ancestral lands of over 500 nations indigenous to North America. By acknowledging and reflecting upon the contemporary lived experiences and histories of the indigenous peoples here and globally, we may begin to take essential steps towards creating a more equitable world. Learn more through the hashtag on our native land initiative of the U.S. Department of Arts and Culture and consider contributing to Indigenous-led organizations doing important work to further health and wellness, sovereignty, and self-determination of the first people of the lands you reside. This podcast is a production of the Brickyard Network, an extension of the Archie Bray Foundation for the Ceramic Arts. To find out more about our lineup of ceramic podcasts, visit brickyardnetwork.org.